100 countries listed on the index, and India is one of the top ones in terms of vulnerability to climate change. You know? What role does law have to play when it comes to climate change? I do believe governments need to lead it, put some stronger laws in place so that we put a price on destroying the environment. What is the connection between women empowerment and environmental conservation? Especially in developing countries, women hold the majority of the agricultural roles. It's called the feminization of agriculture. Women are also natural custodians because we're nurturers. At the heart, our relationship with Mother Earth is as ancient as time. We are mothers incarnate. Mother Earth and the Divine Feminine. To me, most women around you have experienced some sort of harassment. It disappoints me that we still have to deal with sexual assault. By the time a woman who has been abused encounters the law, the violence has already happened to her. Sometimes in India, even if the woman reports it, the perpetrator is free the next day. I don't know how women would have the courage to come forward if their words are not even taken seriously. You know how each one of us has masculine energy and feminine energy in us. We're yeah. both masculine and feminine, uh, the divine masculine and feminine in us at the same time. And the way I look at law and the way I look at being a lawyer, which is a little analytical, calculative, um, taking action, making plans, doing all of that, and look at that as like tapping into our masculine energy uh, side of things. And when I look at you being a social advocate or a poet or a playwright, I look at that as your um, feminine, creative, nurturing energy, right? How do those two come together and how do they feed off each other? That's such an interesting question to start off with because I see it in a very similar way, right? In the sense that, you know, in my background, I was actually a sex crimes prosecutor for five and a half years before I transitioned into public international law. And the criminal justice system is very advers adversarial, right? So we have to present a case, you know, that I almost felt there was a certain persona that I had to take in court in order to be successful, which was that I had to wear a kind of almost toxic masculinity, right? Where, well, I mean that, you know, I have to be extremely confident. Um, I have to, even even as the cases that uh, I was prosecuting me, disturb me on an emotional level, you know, there's no way that I can show any crack in my armor, right? You know, even if you are under upset about something and I think most women in a corporate setting do experience this right like if something at work upsets you uh you will go to the bathroom and cry mm -hmm. and then come out with your makeup completely intact and nobody will know that this ever happened to you right mm -hmm. and it was interesting because I, I wrote a play about women lawyers and this was a very common experience that my friends New York uh London all you know wherever they were practicing they all had that toilet story Right, that we had to, we felt like we were wearing a kind of masculine mask, right, in order to perform our job very effectively as a lawyer. But I would say that what I've come to realize is that that feminine energy, which I guess um, I would class as being conciliatory, you know, empathetic, right? I mean, if we were to rely on like all these stereoty uh, stereotypes of feminine um, characteristics, feminine energy. I actually think that it does have a place in law. And I and I find that, especially when I do multilateral negotiations, uh, you know, at the United Nations, for example, you do need to bring that energy. And it sometimes makes you more effective when you are human about listening to someone, right? And you're not listening to them just to counter them, but you're really listening to engage and listening to find a way forward together. Um, and in fact, I feel like that's the energy that we need um, on an international scale when we solve some of the world's problems, right? We we don't need the adversarial, like, this is my, like, stance and this is your stance and, like, let's fight it out. But we need the bridge building coming together. And which is to say that, you know, it's, it's high time that all these walls that we've seen as masculine are gender balanced and it's high time that women feel comfortable bringing their full selves to the table and not feeling like they have to wear some sort of masculine energy in order to be successful. And to be taken seriously as well. Yeah, as you absolutely. Um, and, and you were saying about um, the arts, right? The act of creation. Um, and, and for me, um, I, I love doing that because it taps into a totally different part of me. Um, as a lawyer, I feel that I'm very linear and logical and I always know what the answer I want to get at is, right? So it's very goal-directed. Mm. But I feel that, that when it comes to the arts, I mean, the act of creation, I feel as if I'm not in control of the process. 
And I think a lot of artists feel that the same way, that there's almost an element of divine inspiration that when I think about creating something, you know, I would I would actually like start off with a prayer that I, I want to create something true and beautiful that speaks something to this world, right? I want to create something that I was created to create with the unique set of experiences that I have as a woman. Um, and so in, in a way, it's, it's very free. It, it can be very frustrating because you, you don't have that goal. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you, you don't know how you're going to get there. I often like lay on my bedroom floor and cry sometimes when I'm trying to write a play or a poem. Um, but it's part of the process. Yeah, it's, part of, it's absolutely part of the process. But at the end of the day, it's, um, I love it because when you manage to produce something, there's a magic in it that you are impressed by yourself. Like, it's, it's, so, it's so outside of yourself. And, you know, you can almost enjoy that product as much as the audience enjoys it. Wow. Um, a lot of artists describe that as being in the flow. Uh, you're almost like a vehicle. You're just a tool. Yeah. And the art speaks through you and it just comes out through you. But as you said, there's, a, there's some sort of divinity in it. There's yeah. something coming from the yeah. source. And it just um, manifests through, through the work that you do. Yeah. Um, there's a book by um, Liz Gilbert, Elizabeth Gilbert, who also wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she talks about this magic of um, creation. How do you um, use art for, you know, social advocacy yeah. and um, social justice? Talking about gender issues, how does that come into play? So what I like to do with your art is to open up that space of compassion, right? Because when you have a certain character who holds a certain set of views, um, and, you know, you bring into it this person's their full like childhood traumas, right? The things that have been through in life, which have causes them to hold that view. Then we kind of understand each other as people, right? And sometimes um, our minds are changed because things hit us at the heart instead of the head. Um, and, and I like the power of art to, to dismantle all of these like long held kind of like super logical conclusions that we have. So as an example, um, then there's a play that I wrote, which is called Hashtag Women Supporting Women. Um, it features a millennial Chinese uh, woman uh, who is the youngest partner in a law firm. And she is has organized a women's empowerment forum for young women. Um, and she ends up uh, in a Zoom breakout room with her former intern, who is a Gen Z uh, Malay, so a minority race in Singapore uh, woman. And I'm not going to spoiler it, but essentially uh, there was a dark secret between them that throws uh, the Chinese character's um, feminism um, into, uh, it just throws it into suspicion about, you know, whether she is really a feminist, right? And and throughout the entire play, um, I mean, the, the central focus of, of it is a sexual assault that has happened in the law firm and their responses to it and why they chose to respond to it in a different way. Um, and, and of course, like along the way, uh, you know, it, it dismantles rape myths, it dismantles uh, ideas that there's a perfect victim. So, I mean, all of these ideas are important ideas which could be delivered in the form of a lecture, of course, but, um, you know, to, to see it embodied in different women on stage and to see the tensions and contradictions play out in the form of a drama, I think that there's, power in that because it engages the heart yeah makes the more you live yeah and makes you i think empathize with the situation yeah a lot more deeply and that's the power of art you're you're absolutely right and um you're right on the buck when you said we need more collaboration and not less people and, and not more people thinking i'm right versus you're right and that's what's happening in the environment and the climate movement as well it's about which solution is better is my um what i'm working on is that better than what you're working on and so instead of can we work on this together as a lawyer, you could have chosen any specialty. You could have chosen any field or trajectory for that matter. Why social impact? Well, for me, my interest in law is very much related to the public interest. So I think that law is the practical language in which the ideals that we hold as a society are realized, meaning that we we'll believe in justice, right? It has to be implemented through laws if we believe in gender equality. It has to be realized through laws and policies, right? So I wanted to be involved in that whole project of realizing the ideals of society. Uh, and I wanted my career to be that, right? So I actually ended up, uh, yeah, from the age of 18, I decided to take a government scholarship from the Singapore government. 
uh, to which was until that they would pay for four years of my education, uh, and then I would come back and work for the government. Uh, and so that's how I, I managed to go to Cambridge and Harvard, completely paid for by the Singapore government. Um, and then when I returned, I, I got to uh, practice uh, as a sex crimes prosecutor. Um, and then I moved into public international law. But to me, that angle of social, um, social impact is so important because I want to see that my life um, has a very clear thread of purpose, right? Like, you know, it's really hard work being a lawyer, right? Like it's, <laughs> I can only up, imagine. <laughs> you end up working really, really long hours. And I don't think personally I would be able to pull that sort of hours if I didn't really believe in what I was doing. Whereas, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of pulling those sorts of hours and then seeing like, oh, this is going to make a difference in the life of um, the woman uh, who uh, is, who you know, whose case is being prosecuted in court, right? It's going to be making a difference to her experience of justice. And right now, as a public international lawyer, um, I has you know, at the back of my head, you know, Singapore's interests, right? And, you know, I get to join in the great project of shaping global norms, which are negotiated by states, uh, often at the United Nations, you know, you have treaties, uh, and, uh, and we are meant to be coming together constructively to come up with these norms. Many of them are related to environmental protection, um, the stewardship of global commons, uh, you know, such as the high seas, which are international waters. Uh, and, and I really do enjoy that process because uh, it, it makes me feel that, uh, you know, it, it's really an, a direct empowerment towards creating change. Yeah. What role does law have to play when it comes to climate change? Well, there are uh, multilateral uh, treaties, right? Like the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, and all of these things are incredibly necessary uh, because it creates obligations for states uh, and and that have to be implemented within their own domestic systems. And it is important to have that level of buy-in, um, you know, because states are the, uh, are the ones that create international law. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that's only one part of the entire equation because within a country, you have corporations, you have individuals. And I do think that climate change is one of those issues that requires everyone to be activated and everyone to have a consciousness of it and for there to be political will but also the will on the level of an individual consumer in order to tackle this existentialist threat of our time. You know, sometimes there are laws that exist and there are policies that exist but when it comes to climate or gender, there's a difference between law and policy versus what is actually being practiced and implemented. Mm -hmm. In, in society yeah. and people say that oh but that needs to be a policy and that needs to be a law yeah. for things to change but even if there's there's laws yeah it doesn't really translate into that um being practiced on a day-to-day -day basis so how do you think we bridge that gap yeah well i think i agree with you 100 percent on that uh you know from the perspective of gender i i really do think that the laws are a very downstream thing in the sense that they are incredibly important to have robust laws against gender violence or sexual assault. But by the time um, a woman who has been abused or sexually assaulted uh, encounters the law, the violence has already happened to her, right? And, and I think what is more important um, to me, I, I've come to realize, is to tackle it beyond the law when you're talking about societal attitudes and certain cultural norms or like gendered expectations which allow uh, to create the conditions of these issues being um, problems today, right? So in the example of violence against women, uh, there are so many patriarchal attitudes, right? Centuries worth of patriarchal attitudes uh, that are deeply entrenched that need to be dismantled. And how do we dismantle them? Laws can't do that work of dismantling. You need social action. You need media. You need art, right? You need conversations. You need um, people to see things differently, uh, and, you know, for example, the, the idea of a perfect victim in the case of a sexual assault, right? Uh, what we often face in, in the course of prosecuting a sex crime is the question that, oh, but she didn't scream when it happened. She waited a while to report. Um, and, and the reality, of course, is that, and, and I think any woman can tell you this, right, from our embodied experience, that trauma manifests in a different, in so many different ways. There's no script, right? Some people um, 
shut down, um, they might go ahead to make breakfast for their rapists. They might wait years before they report it, especially if the violence happened in an intrafamilial setting where they're not able to leave their homes until you know they reach 18 and then they report a childhood abuse, right? We see so many cases of women maybe into their 30s looking back to report something that happened to them um, in their teens. Um, and, and that's just a reality of how the, the human brain comprehends trauma and, and um, the realities of the fact that uh, it is difficult to report. But we are not going to be able to address all of this just by laws, right? Um, you know, when, when you think about um, a survivor's experience from the entire criminal justice system, um, I would love for it to be, you know, the first time the survivor discloses to a friend, that friend is able to give a trauma-informed response uh, where it gives the survivor agency as to what she should do or whether um, she should report it or what are the options available for her. I would love that when the survivor then, let's say, decides to report it, then uh, you know the police um, are uh, they, they they have that awareness of rape myths. They they're not superimposing some sort of template um, in in understanding this woman's story, and I mean it carries all the way through to you know when the case is heard before a court. That all to say that all these societal um, attitudes they are just so important from the perspective of prevention um, of 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 um, gender violence all the way downstream to you know, protection of women and the prosecution of this, um, you know, we need to really shift the way that we think um, of women and, and to stop having limiting beliefs about them or certain uh, narrow scripts of acceptability of how women should behave. So for example, if you wear uh, a short skirt, you are asking for it, right? You know, all, again, that's just tied to gendered expectations and narrow scripts of what's acceptable for a woman to do. and and. These constructs have more to do with society than they do with law. Definitely, because sometimes even if the woman reports it, especially in India, yeah, the prosecutor is just sometimes in, in India. Even if the woman reports it, the perpetrator is free the next day. Yeah, they don't even take any legal action against that perpetrator. So sometimes I don't know how women would have the courage to come forward if their words are not even taken seriously. Yeah, and, and I think there are certain stereotypes that we just have culturally about what rape should look like, that it's stranger rape, right? It's definitely not by someone you've had a sexual relationship with before. But the reality is that women are more often, much more often sexually assaulted by people known to them and that it can happen in the context of a marriage. Rape can happen in the context of a relationship. But if we keep seeing it through the lens of, oh, you know, it has to be like someone jumping you when you're walking back at night, right? Then it, it also, you know, when, when you think from a survivor's perspective and when they're deciding whether or not they should report it, um, they feel less empowered to report it because they can almost hear all the doubt that will creep in because it is quite widely known like around the world that, you know, when, when great victims go... Uh, to report a case, there there can be huge barriers, uh, and and there can be huge, um, yeah, like just a lot of baggage around um, assessing their account, right? Because it seems as if we distrust women's stories, right? Mm. Yeah, so it is something that's so deeply systemic that uh, can really only be solved by all of us. Uh, you know, starting from like conversations that we have uh, with people in our social circles, right? Even guys, um, when they speak to other guys and, you know, they are able to kind of call out some of the locker room chat when, when men say things that are very denigrating about women, uh, you know, women often don't have access to those spaces where they can hear and counter what's being said. So it's really important to have male allies who are able to, to like call things out when they're being spoken in like men only spaces. Yeah. What's the uh, progress that you've seen when it comes to gender laws, uh, over your career, how far have we come? Yeah, well, I think to me, right, unfortunately, um, there, there are, I mean, there's just, it disappoints me that we still have to deal with, uh, with sexual assault to such a high degree. And I really thought that the Me Too movement had a great impact. You know, speaking about, you know, someone who also put out their own uh, account online, 
I felt that, wow, we now have the space to talk about the nuances of this idea of consent, right? And and um, this idea of like, actually, most women around you have experienced some sort of harassment. One in three? Is it one in three? Yeah. Three? And I, well, I think harassment gets even higher. Violence is one in three. That's a UN standard. But when it comes to harassment, um, you know, street harassment, I, I found it quite shocking that a lot of my guy friends, it was it was news to them that women in Singapore get street harassed. You know, and it's like everybody, any woman would say they have an experience of that. Um, and, and I love the fact that we got to talk about that publicly and there was space for that. But what I was very sad about was that uh, when I staged my play, Hashtag Women Supporting Women in 2022, uh, there were several uh, women uh, who were law students in Singapore and uh, in, in the university in Singapore, and they contacted me to say that, you know, we are like Gen Zs, we are like post Me Too movement, um, and this still happened in our school. You know, that there are, there are male students who have victimized, either assaulted or disseminated without consent uh, photographs of a sexual nature of women. Online and violence is the... Yeah, that, that's violence as well. And they've done all of that and they're still sitting in the classroom, right? And um, it is the, it is the woman who has to deal with the brunt of like, you know, the social Excuse exclusion. Me. Yeah, right. And, and you know, the way that we deal with campus by uh, sexual violence, right? That's another thing because uh, it's not just about the country's laws, but it's also like your individual company's HR policy or your school's policy for these sorts of things. And and all of this is informed by people sitting in boardrooms and who who do we have usually in a boardroom, right? You know, usually it's it's predominantly men, unfortunately. Um and, and so really the whole project of um eliminating uh gender violence and sexual assault rides on the entire project of women's equality and having women's views heard in places of power um, and really to approach that also from an intersectional perspective and and realize that you know it's not just you can't just have the majority race women speaking for everyone because you know my experience as a Chinese majority woman in Singapore is colored greatly by that majority privilege right whereas my friends who are um, of different minorities are Indian, actually, Malay yes in the okay, although yeah, the they would have a rad radically different view from me, right? Because their experience of microaggressions or just outright aggression are beyond the scope of, of what I have experienced um, as a majority woman living in Singapore. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up intersectionality because being in the space of gender and climate, there's so many things that I didn't know, especially when it comes to gender-based violence, because at, as soon as there's a climate disaster, droughts or flood and if a if a farmer or father loses the source of livelihood there's an uptick in uh, gender violence immediately in areas whether they're like camps or uh, you know flood prone areas uh, droughts that manifests gender-based violence gender-based violence domestic yeah, yeah, violence yeah yeah and I, I need here another dimension which is also like income and economic uh, inequalities also come in right um that people who live in poverty are more vulnerable um, and women who live in poverty are more vulnerable as well. And I think it is very important to make sure that these conversations, uh, you know, their voices are heard when it comes to laws and policies um, and, and also that their experiences are considered. And I also think it's important that we don't look at it from the angle that they are like passive victims of their circumstances and that we, you know, empowered women who are educated are therefore like their saviors. But because I, I think that's absolutely the wrong way to see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, that uh, these women are experts in their own condition. So if you want to deal with poverty, you've got to speak to an expert in poverty, which is someone who has lived life under those constraints and then understand their experience. What's one change you want to see in the world? Oh, you know, I have a very, very modest change. Um, and that is uh, menstrual hygiene products. Uh, I, I think that they should be freely available. Um, and and I think you know in that there is I mean so much to unpack in that right I feel tax yes, to begin with and yeah. access to education um, for for girls in rural area um, a lot of them uh, you know because of certain cultural stigma to do with periods when they have a period it's very hard for them to get to school um, when they don't have the, the menstrual hygiene products and and I think that the reason why this is such a 
you know, why it's not even free yet is because men don't have periods. If they had periods and they knew what we had to go through, we would have laws. Yeah, we would have laws about it. Long. We would have menstrual leave because so many women do experience like terrible pain, right? And and I mean, I'm sure you've seen all those YouTube videos of um, them uh, stimulating pain on men. Yeah, and then like and them crying. Yeah, yeah, they're crying, and then like the woman is like, "This is just my regular period, Literally right? Literally monthly. What what we go through on the monthly basis." Yes, yes. And I mean, underneath all of that is is that there's like not enough research being done on women's reproductive issues. So you have things like endometriosis, which very very under research. Uh, and if and I'm they say worse. Yes, same, same yes. Class. I have um I have some primary dysmenorrhea. I mean, I have you know like I have like several things right that when undiagnosed, a terrible period. I'm always lying on the floor. I'm convinced that if um yeah seriously, if men went through this pain, we will have menstrual leave from work. And it wouldn't be something that we would feel like embarrassed about telling our boss, right? Because it would just be like, oh yeah, you've got your period. Okay, yeah. you have a day off, right? <laughs> and to normalize that, how cool would be? Yeah, like, yeah. To live in a world like that. Which is why like, I personally feel that I want to talk about my period publicly uh, because I want to remove that stigma around talking about women's reproductive to health. And, and it's also why in my play, Cycle Bitch, you know, I had this whole segment on menstruation. You know, because the character is trying to explain to her um, tech CEO boyfriend the four reasons why she cried in public in the course of her relationship. And because she's a type A perfectionist character, she decides to make a slight deck and it has infographics of her menstrual cycle. I need to watch this. Oh, it's, it's going to be in Edinburgh this August uh, for the Fringe Festival from 1st to 26th August. So, I'll make yeah. my way well, <laughs> to watch this. <laughs> So that sounds really, that sounds like me. That sounds I am a type A. Oh yeah, she's an adrenaline type as well. You podcast, right? I think you would really I would vibe. I make a slide deck for anyone asking me why I cried in public because I think that happens more often than I can I can count. Oh yeah, but I mean, that's another stereotype we have to dismantle around like uh, women's emotionalism, right? When women make their emotional needs known, there's that trope that we are a psycho bitch. Uh, whereas when men make their emotional needs known, we, well, there's not much of a culture around them making their emotional needs known. But you know, we, we don't have that kind of stereotype when, when a man um, has an emotional outburst in, in public. Whereas for women, when we do it, pathologize, right? Even from the etymology of a word hysteria, uh, which it comes from hysta, which is the word for womb. Word for womb? Yeah. Hysta is the Greek um, word for womb or uterus. So hysteria. I'm, I've comes never from connected that. With yeah, so it's, it's just for centuries women have been, you know, stereotyped and pathologized for having emotions and psycho bitch was my way of dismantling that. Even though that was such a modest ask and all you want is for there to be equity yeah. in, in menstruation and in HR policy, which is, you're, you're right, we're biologically just different. Yeah. But there was such backlash in India around this as well. And there's been backlash around the world that if women are asking for equality and if you want an equal world, why would you want separate laws? Why do you want separate HR policies? If we're all saying we want, we want to be equal and we want something that's fair and yeah. uh, representative of all of us. Uh, the needs should just be equal and there shouldn't be a thing like this uh, that discriminates, that gives us an extra leave or that discriminates against, like, against us almost, even though it's a policy for us. So there was a huge amount of backlash when it came to menstruation leave or um, giving a day off for um, to women on the first day of their period. Yeah, I mean, that's alarming to me because, you know, men have been, for centuries, they have been the ones structuring HR policies where you meet on the surface apply university, but the fact is that they've been structured having one person in mind, right? So, I mean, you think about jobs. I remember when I first started my job at international law, a mentor told me that a lot of the jobs in international law or in international organizations like the UN, they are, or they have been, you know, historically structured around you having a wife to pack your bags so that you can go on trip. Right, so there are all these unpaid labor. Yeah, deeply inherent ways in which existing HR policies have been um, structured it, with one template in mind, which is usually a man, a male professional doing his job, right? And I think we need to account for the fact that people have diverse needs, right? And that the when it comes to, I mean, you have differentiation for ma- maternity and paternity, right? Uh, and and there's a biological reason for that. Right? So I, I don't see why this should be an impediment. 
Amanda, you wear so many hats and you wear them so well. You're a public international lawyer, playwright, poet, a social advocate. And knowing how all of these things intersect and come together, I want to ask what does sustainability mean to you? Sustainability from the perspective of the environment or just the word sustainability? The word sustainability to you knowing every different role that you play. How does it all come together? Well, I, I think when I think of that word in relation to my own life, um, I think about whether I'm going to have the energy to be able to keep operating in so many different spheres, right? Um, and yeah, you know, I think that I need to develop wisdom around rest. And I think that's an Oh, so, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's right. so important. Yeah, <laughs> I love hearing that from a lawyer. Right? Yeah, <laughs> more of that. I, I think there's something that, you know, you find your, firstly, your body's aging. Secondly, especially for creation as an artist, you can only really create from a point of fullness, right? And, you know, I have to consume so much art and be challenged in the ways that I think about the world, right? And different issues, all of that leads me to being a better artist. And the only way to sustain that sort of work is to be able to know when to rest, to, to know when to say no. And because we operate in such a capitalist society where it's always like, let's climb this ladder, let's produce this, and we measure, yeah, yeah. And we measure ourselves in terms of KPIs, right? Productivity, kind of targets, what we produce. But I think we all need to just slow down a little bit because it's not about the quantity, right? It's about the intention and the sense of purpose. Um, that we have, and I need to do that. <laughs> Don't tell anyone from. I need to hear it from. Yeah, so and I think so many of us, right? Because especially as very, very motivated women, um, we're always looking at the next thing. But what if we just spend more time in the present and allowing ourselves to like fully, you know, imbibe what the present and even consolidate the experiences from our past? I think that makes us stronger for our future. That's beautiful. Thank you. My last question to you is any piece of advice to anyone watching this, anything you've learned over the course of your career? Oh, I think I would just have to go back to what I said. You know, we need to be able to learn to rest and to know our limits. Um, and I think to not apologize for ourselves, right? I think women apologize way too much for many different things, right? Start a sentence with sorry. Yes. I, I do that all the time as a tick. Uh, we apologize for taking up space. We apologize, um, you know, when some, someone has done something wrong to us. Uh, and I think um, to to have a sense of self worth that exists beyond our accomplishments and our achievements, um, I think that's a very important thing to have because I, I feel that with women sometimes you know we can really feel like it's a competition, right? It's a zero sum game, especially. And, and you know, we've all heard stories where, you know, there are very unpleasant je jealousies in, in female friendships because we're comparing ourselves to like different women. And I, I think that's, that's like toxic for everyone, right? Um, I, I, and I think that's why we need to locate that sense of self beyond what we do um, and in who we are and the values that we stand for and the integrity of our character. I love that so much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank, Thank you so you. much for doing this with me. And Thank you for your work and your beautiful art and the policies that you shape around the world and the laws that you shape and that will dictate um, an equitable, safer, greener future for all of us. Thank so, you, Shira. Thank you. This Thank is you such so a much. great chat. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So the real story here is that I used to keep coming back to Singapore and I, I lived here for eight years. I, you, you know that. I remember that. But um, the first time I came back after moving out, I wanted to meet and connect with people in the sustainability space. And I don't think I did that enough. And the minute I typed sustainability, obviously your name was one of the first names that popped up. And I remember just clicking on your profile. I was sitting in 1880 and I, I remember looking at your credentials and I remember going through all your accomplishments and thinking to myself that when I'm your age, I want to be, even if I'm half the woman that you are today, I'd be so happy with my life. You've done such incredible things. Thank you, Shreya. I really appreciate you saying that. I don't think I deserve that. Uh, and it's so funny that you say that. So when I look at my mom, I actually feel that way. I feel that way too. I, I really I look up to her and admire her in so many ways. I can hear the emotion in my voice. Yeah. Um, and we all need that. We all need that. People that we look up to, right? And that doesn't mean they're perfect. We just I aspire to, you know, to to emulate some of the things that they do and with what they represent. And to have a blueprint, it's so important for 
especially us in sustainability, human rights, finding our way, stumbling through it because it's it's not been done um, there's largely not one way and widely. Even. And there's, yeah, not there's even no one way. way. Yeah. So to see someone living it and living it so proudly and boldly, you're you're definitely an inspiration, even even if you don't believe it. And then, <laughs> even if you question that. Very kind. <laughs> Why do we do that as women, right? Uh, we, we I know, right? Yeah. I know. I know it's difficult for us to uh, take a compliment. It's still difficult for me to do that. I'm, you know, of course, very grateful when people say nice things, you know, and, but I, we're complicated about it, aren't we? And we probably shouldn't, but, you know, it's just the way we often are. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. <laughs> do you think your younger self would be proud of you where you are today? Or what, who did you want to be when, when you were growing up as maybe a 10 year old? You know, it's, um, it's a great question. I don't often ask myself that. So, when I was young, um, my only aspiration was to work in sports. I didn't want to start a nonprofit or, you know, I didn't, I was affected by the poverty I had seen around me in the Philippines growing up. So that was something that was very close to my heart. Um, I shared this on the panel just some, a few moments ago that when I was born and raised in the Philippines, my, mo- my mother's country, and then when I was five, I moved to France, my father's country, and then came back when I was 10. And then that's when the poverty really hit me. Because I realized that we were so lucky, you know, uh, I had a good education, a nice roof over my head, but the majority of the people in the Philippines didn't live that way. And there was a real sense of injustice. When we drove past, uh, when they picked my aunt picked me up from the airport, when I came home to the Philippines when I was 10 years old, from after five years in France, I saw the poverty and the slums. I saw children just my age. And there was a real sense of injustice and powerlessness, more importantly. So perspective shifted. My perspective shifted. I was a very sensitive child. You know, I'm still a sensitive person. You, you can see it. I'm all heart, you know. But it was it affected me. And I remember telling my mom, why them and not me? It's not fair. And she said, it's not fair. The world is not fair. You don't choose to where you are born, you know, and some people are very unlucky in, in the circumstances, maybe at least the, the, the physical material things, you know, maybe not in the spiritual way. But um, so that had affected me. And I saw also climate change, you know, uh, and, and the, you know, it's typhoons, earthquake floodings, and, you know, from also our region is very affected by that, right? Um, and always the most vulnerable were impacted. So there was very early on, there was a sense that it's not fair. Why did I have all these opportunities and why not everyone else? But my only aspiration was to work in sport. So I went to university in Japan. I, my first client, uh, my first job was actually advertising with Ken Erickson. And then one of our clients was Nike. And so that was, that was the aspiration at the time. Like, I want to work in sports. I want to work in communications. Uh, I played a lot of sports growing up. Football was my sport. So I ended up joining Nike in the U.S. and working in football. So it was a dream come true for me. Yeah. And I ended up working then in the U.S., uh, Latin America, Europe, and Singapore. That's how I came to Singapore many years ago. So I had this corporate career, even though it wasn't a, you know, very formal culture. Mm. Um, and I thought I was doing well and, and you know, kind of living my life. I, I was a mommy of two when I came to Singapore already. Um, now you're a mom of four. Yeah, I'm a mom of four. Now remarried. So the first two were for my first marriage. I'm very good friends with my ex-husband. Um, and it was a, a moment where I had a pivotal um, uh, experience. You know, when I came to Singapore after a few years working for Nike, I felt that I was happy, but yeah, I was not complete. I was lacking a little bit of purpose. You know, we all have those moments where we question ourselves. Uh, women do that a lot. You know, we're always questioning ourselves. Am I on the right path? Am I leading the life that I'm meant to live, right? What am I here to um, do? Yeah, exactly. So I met a mountaineer, a French mountaineer, a lady who was about to climb Everest. Uh, and I had just given birth to my fourth child. I was feeling very grateful for, you know, having rebuilt my life after my divorce and just being happy with a nice career again. Uh, very many blessings, you know. I saw her climb Everest. On the summit of Everest, she unfolded a banner that said, Bearing the flag for women everywhere. Wow. In support of so a charity powerful. that supports women survivors of war. And that really hit me in the gut. And I said, I want to support that. So when she came back down the mountain and she was living in Singapore, she told me that she had volunteered with this charity in London called Women for Women International. It's a very well-established charity that operates in eight war-torn regions around the world, supporting women survivors of war. Uh, she, her name is Valérie Bofi, and she became my co-founder in my first nonprofit, Women on a Mission. So we started that together with another co-founder called Karim Morge. So two French women and me, part French. Um, climbed to Everest Base Camp with a team of uh, women, raised $150,000 for that charity. And that's how Women in a Mission was born. We, you know, I put my marketing hat on from my Nike training and I wrote a press release that said, Women on a Mission to Reach Higher Ground, a play on words. And people started calling us the Women on a Mission. My sister did the logo. 
And that's how we started. Yeah. You know, women were coming after, you know, messaging us saying, when's the next expedition? Yeah. Um, so now 12 years later, we've, you know, I've done, I've set up a second NGO called Her Planet Earth, also leading expeditions, but with an environmental lens, 23 expeditions, hundreds of women on, on expeditions with us from not just Singapore, from around the world. So it's been something that I'm the most proud of and that uh, has given me a lot of meaning and purpose. So your sport still comes into play. You still I love get sport, to tap into adventure. that with your, with your adventure. Yeah, I you love know, exploration. it's meant to come to one of them. I the know, one that you went to Antarctica. You have to. You still have and to. And I, I read the itinerary and the amount of physical activity. I, say, I don't think I'm cut out for this. So we have I all sorts. Think... Uh, we have tougher ones and easier ones. Yeah, so I'm not going to give up There's a beach one. It's <laughs> 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 okay. Beach one, maybe kayaking, but this time we're going to the north. We're going to Norway in you September. You have to kayak with me doing the heavy lifting. As long as you're, I'm sure you're very you're fit. I'm sure you're very fit. We'll we'll talk about that separately. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, knowing you're French, Swiss, and Filipina, being in the space of sustainability, having seen environmental injustice in the Philippines, what difference do you see in the understanding of sustainability and environmental justice across the world in the in the global north and the global south? So, you know, again, I, I mentioned this just recently in the panel. Uh, we all we all know very well that the ones who caused climate change are not the ones who are going to be suffering the most, right? So there is an injustice already there. And yet we are in the same planet. We're in the same boat in so many ways. Uh, and we have to deal collectively. Uh, you know, that sense of collaboration is something that really keeps me up at night. And this is where I feel I can add value through my experience, you know, through my network. And that's why I'm trying to do so many things, not just in the philanthropic space, but more recently with a new in uh, initiative I set up with a partner in New York called Investors for Climate to move as much capital as possible towards innovative solutions in the climate tech space to solve climate change. The injustice is there. The most vulnerable will unfortunately suffer the most. By 2050, we're expecting over 1 billion climate refugees. It's going to affect all our borders, all our neighboring countries. Um, we have to be aware of that. And again, uh, you know, NGOs are probably not prepared for that. Governments are not prepared for that. So uh, it's easy to get caught up on, uh, on this sense of hopelessness. But I refuse to because it, it, it makes you paralyzed, right, to, to think that way. Uh, but you have to keep that in mind because the urgency is so real. And so that's what fuels me uh, in any way I can, you know. Uh, but there is not one solution. Um, I see that philanthropies and charities still need support, even though their business model is something that's very difficult because they rely on grants and donations. Yet they are the conscience of society and need our support and often are there for the most vulnerable and, and also push governments to be accountable. So I'll always do what I can to support it. But I also realize that raising funds for philanthropy is just a drop in the ocean. And there's so much more capital that we can try to influence and move towards other actual solutions. Tech is one of them, but it's not the only one. Ultimately, we need to also fuel money towards biodiversity protection. Um, so that is a key one. And you know from you know, growing up in the same region as us, you know, that uh, you, you have so many vulnerable people in your own country, uh, you know, over a billion, right? And what's the population now uh, of India? 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion. You're the most populous country in the world, right? And so also very much at risk climate change. You're one of the top, there are, I think, 100 countries listed on the index and India is one of the top ones in terms of vulnerability to climate change. Right? Yeah. And Mumbai, the, the city that I live in, it's uh, in the top 10 cities most vulnerable to climate change as well. So. We definitely have that. And the story that you narrated, the story that you spoke about in you growing up, coming back to the Philippines and seeing that it's so similar to what I experienced because um, I think that's the reason I'm in this space as well because my, my area was very flood prone. The, the town that I grew up in was a flood prone area. I remember going to school and there were times when school was just shut off for two months because of the heavy rains and people had water like up to up to almost, you know, their their hips and their necks in, in bodies and houses were destroyed in monsoon. And I remember thinking to my thinking to myself, why is this not happening to us? Why is this not happening in my house? But everyone else is suffering. There's death around there, crocodiles in people's houses. Seeing all of that, I didn't have the vocabulary that this is climate change or that it's a consequence of climate change, just that it was unfair. And I don't know what it meant back then. But Obviously, having learned that and studied that and knowing um, how these are just going to become more rampant and more frequent and more disastrous in the process, we can't not do anything about it. Exactly. And you're raising awareness through multiple channels as well. Even just putting a podcast together raises awareness uh, and funds many, in many ways, you know, by giving a voice to people who are We have also, to talk about it. Of course we do. Even if we're the social, the party poopers, the social justice party poopers that just kind of dampen the mood everywhere. I think we have to, we have to talk about these issues. 
what is the most effective solution, according to you, to the multiple crises yeah. that we're facing? So I do think that there are some big uh, issues that need to be pushed at the government level because, you know, there is this myth that has been pushed on consumers that it's by reducing bits and pieces of our uh, emissions that is going to solve it. And so that was this narrative was pushed by the big oil companies. But the truth is, the, the, the truth is, there are basically 90 companies around the world that are producing the majority of the emissions. And a lot of the policies in place are, do not control that. So there is movement and there's progress. Europe has done a great job of actually talking to corporates and making them more accountable with how they dispose of their products, how they source ma raw materials. It's not happening as much in Asia yet. So we need to uh, work with governments and corporates. But the gov I do believe governments need to lead it and uh, put some stronger laws in place so that we put a price on destroying the environment. Because still, that is not the case. People are still throwing waste from uh, their factories with you know, chemicals. Uh, they are destroying local communities, you know, even though they employ some of the local people as well. It's, there's not enough um, governance around this space. So that is a big part of it. Uh, you know, the uh, humans and society can continue to advocate and push governments to hold the council. So youth activists, you know, any kind of advocacy is good if, it, if it's done in a constructive way. I'm not uh, someone who believes in shaming or um, driving an, uh, an, a narrative that is too negative and depressing because I think, again, you stop action. So come, I come to the table as much as I can with constructive ideas. And then funds, you need funds, you need to fund climate solutions in the tech space, you need to look at our food system, we need to look at ways of purifying water. Um, and it, we're not just talking about water in the ocean, we're actually talking about what they call green water, you know, from, from the, the land and how connected that is to the bio, protecting biodiversity and, and how precious water is and, and how that is going to be the biggest commodity in the future because most places will be lacking in water and that is such an instrumental part to keeping people alive and healthy. Yeah. Um, so, what, a what lot, basically. so it's a long answer to your question, but the truth is there's so much we need to do and everybody in their own capacity and in their own expertise, if you're, if you're a scientist, a communicator, a politician, a banker, there's always something you can do, right? In your, because we cannot just all have the same skill set. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a complicated answer, but I do think it takes global collaboration. You sit on the board of so many companies and, and corporations and nonprofits. What what change have you seen over the years in prioritizing profit over the planet and thinking about sustainability as part of the business model? And how do businesses do that more often where profit and um, sustainability are not separate, they're not mutually exclusive, but they go hand in hand? So I would say that I've definitely seen progress. So it's going in the right direction. Like maybe 15 years ago when we were talking about sustainability, it was like part of CSR, which was a nice to have women empowerment. You know, when I started my NGOs more than 12 years ago, Oh, Christine, you're pushing, gen, you know, that, that agenda, you know, women's empowerment, sustainability, environmental conservation. That was just the nice to have in many corporations. Luckily, it's at front and center of business more and more. It's still not at the level that I'd like it to be. But now the chief, uh, you know, ch the chief executive officer will, will either play the role of the chief sustainability officer as well. You're having much more representation on board of an environmental expert. Uh, they realize that actually it makes business sense to uh, be very aware of how the environment can impact your business and what you're putting uh, also into nature, the, you know, the, the, the cyclical nature of what you're producing, what happens to it after it's sold, et cetera. So more and more, the awareness is there and more and more, they understand that it's good business sense to be, to lead your business in a sustainable yeah, way. Your supply chain of nature. Yeah. So there is progress. Okay. It's never enough. I'm never satisfied. <laughs> um, I'm on the board of three nonprofits. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I do a lot of fundraising for nonprofits, so they do like me very much. Um, and I'm also on the board of uh, two venture capital groups um, and uh, one more, which is an impact investment exchange, which is an exchange uh, looking at impact investing. So trying to do what I can in terms of influence and leadership there to support, especially women in, uh, in the startup space. Um, you know, the, the great thing about being on leadership roles like that is that you can actually have a say and veto certain decisions when necessary to make sure that we have the diversity in our portfolio, for example. So that we're not just saying, yeah, we're going to invest in women, but we're actually going to have maybe close to 50% with at least one woman founder in our portfolio. So things like that are where you can put a little bit of influence by making introductions, but also voting and saying that it's not good enough. Let's keep pushing. You know, let's find more women startups in our portfolio. Yes, amen to that. That's what I mean by I can't keep up with you. I don't know. The, the three boards here and the three boards there, it's, it's impossible to keep up with you. So where do you get 
this amount of energy from this never ending, um, yeah. relentless source of energy from and what keeps you going and what gives you hope. <laughs> So I am an extrovert. Uh, you ha you must have guessed. Uh, and actually, you know, when I take my teams on expeditions, I make them take this personality test. It's called 16 personalities. I don't know if you've done that. And I constantly uh, score on like 98% uh, uh, extrovert. extrovert. Is it the Myers-Briggs one? The... It's almost like the Myers-Briggs, but it's called 16 personality. It's like a shortened version. Right. And it's actually quite accurate. Okay. So, so for me, it's really interesting to know what kind of personalities I'm taking with me on my teams because, you know, operating in a regular environment in a city versus being uh, really cold or really hot in a more hostile environment will bring out those personalities. So I know what to expect in terms of how people prefer to digest information, if there's a change of the itinerary, et cetera, right? So I constantly score very, very extreme extrovert. And I realize that, of course, I get energy from being around people. So that's a big source of uh, energy for me. Like, I'm not one of those people that, in a conference needs to be in a quiet room for a while and say, I need to be quiet. So that never happens to me. <laughs> and one friend told me she did that and I was like, hmm, that never that's happens weird. to me. That's okay, okay, I'm really an extrovert. So I yeah. do get energy from people. I don't need that much sleep. So I have, I'm very, I, I wore a Ura ring for many years. I, I stopped for a year just to change. I wasn't looking at the data, but I realized that the, the quality of my sleep, even if it's very short, is very good. So I dive into REM sleep very fast. I can fall asleep and go into very deep sleep very fast. And as a result, the quality of my sleep is very good and I don't need more than five hours, let's well, say, super on average, well. yeah. you know? So, so that is an efficiency of how I operate, I guess. Of course, it could catch up with you, so you got to rest sometimes. I stay, I exercise, I, I do a lot of self-care. Uh, I eat very healthily. Like, I really think about what I'm eating uh, in my week. Like, I plan it very carefully, my exercise. I always carve out time to have exercise. And so I prioritize that. You no, know, I really say, no, I'm going to not take that call and I'm just going to tell them I'm busy because I'm going to do that one hour at the gym that I said I was going to do, you know? So being a little bit selfish allows you to take care of yourself, eat healthy. I do enjoy a drink once in a while. But yeah, I think, you know, if you feel healthy uh, physically, it affects how you are also mentally, right? Um, and, and then just having a mindset, right? A mindset when you go and have difficulties in your life or something's uh, going on with one of your kids or you had a fight with your partner, of course that affects you, right? But the mindset of trying to find solutions, so uh, problem solving, action oriented, having that mindset and say, okay, I'm going to try to look at it with a glass half full, that has helped me a lot. And I think the Filipinos are very uh, optimistic. Right? That's why I definitely took that from the Philippines. Yeah, like, even though our country is really going through a lot of things, it's a very poor country. They're actually one of the happiest people in the world. They're the known super for that. Too, the so, super funding. So that helps. I think all that helps. Yeah. What gives you hope in the environmental space? And by the way, if I go on this boot camp with you, where I'm training like you, with you, eating what you're eating, doing the way that you go, I will come on those adventure camps 100%. Great. I want you to come. It needs a year of training with you under you. Uh, guiding, guiding that boot camp will make it happen. I'll, I'll sign up for that gym membership tomorrow. But, but you know, there's a lot of hope still. You know, there, I mean, you read the news and it's easy to get overwhelmed with the, the news that gets reported about the murders and the wars. There's so much that's wrong with the world, but yet there's so much that's still good with the world. There's so many good people fighting the good fight. And, the wonderful thing about our ecosystem, you know, in Singapore, in many parts, even globally, you know, people who care about sustainability, they have those values at the core. And so they really do. They have empathy. They want to take action. They want to try to you know, support, you know, the, the, and, and diverse, diversify their investments because they're aware that you can't just invest in people who look like you, right? So people understand that. So there's a lot of good and you have to focus on the good and, and try to multiply that. That's really my advice, I think, to stay optimistic and positive. There's only one way to go. You have to keep hoping, even if the scientific data is very scary around climate change. And I work with um, uh, the Earth Observatory of Singapore as one of my clients. I know the team very well. They're a team of scientists. I traveled with them to Antarctica to do research on the Antarctic ice sheet last year. So, you know, that knowledge that Antarctica is melting, the waters are going to pull towards the equator primarily. So, again, Southeast Asia, our region, very much impacted. It's very scary. But, you know, you, can't, you have to go beyond and say, okay, so what can I do? What am I doing? Am I going to try to support these initiatives? Are we going to try to build the resilience of women in particular? Are we going to work with governments, work with policy? The, we are over what? How, what's the population of the world? Are almost 8 billion now? Yeah. So 8 billion people, we can move it and create this movement in many ways. There's hope. So we can't, we can't lose hope. We have to keep thinking that way. And that gives me so much hope. You mentioned bringing women at the forefront of this and a lot of initiatives that you've started focused on that intersection between women and climate change. 
what is the connection between female empowerment, women empowerment, and um, environmental conservation? So, you know, I didn't see that before because my first NGO was just women on a mission, and it was to support women impacted by violence because violence is one of the biggest issues around the world, even in developing or you know, rich countries, it impacts women, you know, hashtag me too and all that. So I started with that NGO and I hadn't realized that there was such a strong connection with women in climate until I met one of my, my friends who had was working at Facebook at the time. Actually, she came with me to Antarctica to climb. And she said, Christine, you know what you're doing in women's empowerment? There is so much connection with, with, with the climate. So I started researching, okay? And I understood that, uh, especially in developing countries like in Asia and Africa, women hold the majority of the agricultural roles as men goes to the, to the cities to look for work. It's called the feminization of agriculture. So women are actually at the forefront of climate change because they are there with the children uh, cultivating the land. And anytime that there's a fire and shift in the weather, they are right experiencing those difficulties in Africa. Women are also responsible for collecting food and, and uh, firewood. And so droughts happen. They have to walk further. They are exposed. There's a very strong connection. And the wonderful thing is when you empower and support women and help them build livelihoods that are eco-friendly and compatible with nature, you are building the resiliency of the family, the village, and the nation. There's a very, very strong connection. Uh, women are also natural custodians because we're nurturers. At the heart, our relationship with Mother Earth is as ancient as time. We are mothers incarnate. Um, and so th those nurturing qualities are completely aligned with how we need to care for the planet. And that's what you'll see in a lot of sustainability roles, women are there. It's just that we have to move them to the leadership level because as we get to the board role, again, we don't have enough women. We need more women in STEM as well because engineers, you know, it's the same in the environmental space, you know. Um, so, so there is that natural uh, pull and women understand that we need to care more for nature because that's who we are. That's how we were built, you know. Mother Earth and the Divine Feminine. As you brought up STEM, I did want to ask how we bring more women into STEM? So STEM definitely is a key, and, and we, it starts with education. We were, I was just um, on a, I, I lead the uh, Investable Women's Network, uh, which is the VC I'm on the board of, an Australian VC, and we had an uh, uh, online session today. We were just talking about bringing more women in STEM uh, because it is a challenge, you know, and it's all, it starts with education. So the way we educate uh, children, you know, and, and give them toys that are a certain way. So it starts with that in, in, in telling girls that they should do marketing or PR roles rather than take the sciences, you know? So that starts at education at home. Obviously, we need to create more opportunities, universities, schools, grants. Uh, so there are many, luckily, uh, United Women Singapore. Uh, actually, I just met one of the directors who was in the hall today. They do an amazing program in Singapore to bring more young women, 11, 12 years old, to encourage them to pursue careers in STEM. Uh, there are organizations in the U.S. that also give prizes to give a zero gravity fight for young women who are working. So obviously we need to encourage that in our society. So a lot more of these initiatives so that funds, need to be replicated. You know, definitely make it easier for women and, and work with society so that we don't put them, pigeon box them into, this is a career for women. You know, this is the only thing that you can think of. Um, so there's a lot of work to be doing around that. Definitely. I do want to ask you, considering how I said you were a role model for me, any advice to young women, young girls who want to follow the same path that you walked on, that you were a trailblazer on? What have you learned over the course of your career? I think the biggest advice I would I could give you is just to to say yes more to opportunities that align with your values. So whatever it is that you care deeply about, obviously you care about sustainability, but I'm sure there are many other causes that are close to your heart because we all get influenced, especially as young children, by different um, experiences that impact us. So when you evaluate an opportunity to partner with a client, to take on a new project, to work with friends and build a company, whatever it is, do a check, a quick check and say, does this really align at the gut with my values? And then really put your hand up and don't worry about finding the time. Uh, and that's why people thought, oh, you're doing so much, but if it aligns, I will do it. And, and, and every year I do reassess. Okay. I reassess at the end of the year and I say, okay, I, uh, which are the ones I really enjoy, because you got to enjoy it to be, you know, to, for you to do it well and, and to do it sustainably. Which are the ones that were, I felt I was more effective. And then which are the ones that maybe I want to divest from. So I reassess every year and it's okay. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to stick to something that you really don't enjoy or you feel you're not really adding value. So I think it's being flexible in, in the way you operate around you and your ecosystem, but also being very true to where you put your time and energy. We talked about how your own energy as a person is so valuable and precious and how you need to protect that as well, right? So that's not just about connecting with people that either suck your energy or give you energy. So you have to be careful about that too. Oxygen thieves, Oxygen as you call thieves them. Oxygen thieves is what I call them. 
sounds terrible, but sometimes you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, oh, it's but true. Yeah. There are people who, who yeah. suck that in this. And you know, as industry. I said, you know, after you spend time with them, you, you then you leave the room and you go like, well, I don't feel so that great. Really, yeah, so you yeah. see, so be aware, have that self-awareness, I guess. Uh, but yeah, just say yes more to initiatives that touch you deeply uh, and give it a try. You know, then you'll find that it opens other doors and you're going to meet other interesting people. That's how my career evolved. Um, it really took off when I started my first NGO. I have to say I was doing quite well at Nike. I was promoted very young and I loved, so there was passion still for sports. But it really took off when I became an advocate for th- something that touched me deeply. I started shining more. I started being more passionate. Um, and, and even though our business model for our two NGOs is actually we're volunteers, whatever we fundraise, we donate, it actually opened so, so many other doors for me to balance uh, that career. And that's why I set up my consultancy and did other things that eventually, you know, was able to make it very lucrative for me as well. Um, so it's really true that, you know, if you put your time and energy in something, your passion, you're going to find a way to monetize that. And, and it's going to bring back so much to you, not just money, but of course, many other uh, opportunities and being just happier in general as a person, healthier, happier, you know, that's the most important. Thank you. <laughs> Christine, my last question to you is what does sustainability mean to you? So for me, it's very personal. Sustainability means being aware that the most vulnerable are going to suffer the most and that those in privilege and positions of power pay to do more. That's all. It's as simple as that. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for the work that you do and for being so rooted in your purpose and for making that infectious and uh, inspiring me every step of the way and so many others that I'm sure of and I can't wait to join uh, oh, that ma- to. on that mission with you, you one day. I'm going to add you on my uh, mailing list for the trekkers yeah, list I'll, I as long as you sign me up on your boot camp oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank oh, you for being I'm, I'm so grateful thank you you're such thank a good you. interviewer